right. Well, we have 11 a.m., so we're going to go ahead and get started. Good morning, and thank you for joining us for our second quarterly seminar presentation for the Great Lakes Rural Opioid Technical Assistance Regional Center, funded by SAMHSA. I'm Kelly Cabral, a project director for the Ohio Youth Resilience Collaborative at The Ohio State University. A little bit here about our project. So tapping into Cooperative Extension's strong commitment to healthy individuals, families, and communities, we aim to address opioid and stimulant use in rural communities across Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Minnesota, Ohio, and Wisconsin. In many areas, Extension is a key stakeholder that communities look to for leadership, education, and translating research into action. We aim to leverage our deep local ties in rural communities to provide technical assistance in the prevention, intervention, and recovery practices of opioid use and related substance use disorders. Our goal for these virtual seminars is not only to provide educational opportunities, but also to build a toolkit for community resiliency. So we will be inviting all of you participants to send us a resource or a tool related to, the to today's topic if you feel inspired. We'll disseminate the toolkit after the seminar so that we all may become better practitioners with wider and deeper toolkits at the ready. Just a quick note here too, um, the Rota RC project promotes the use of affirming person-first language when discussing behavioral health disorders. Non-stigmatizing recovery-oriented language can help reduce negative bias and promote successful engagement in treatment and recovery. I am so pleased to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Alex Ellswick is a tireless advocate for people with substance use disorders. He currently serves, univers serves University of Kentucky as an assistant professor and extension specialist for substance use prevention and recovery. Alex is a trained researcher, recovery coach, and mental health therapist, as well as the co-founder of Voices of Hope, a peer-driven recovery community organization. But most importantly, Alex is himself a person in long-term recovery from the chronic disease of addiction. Welcome, Alex. Thank you so much, Kelly. Thanks for having me. Um, I'm really excited for this opportunity in part because Kelly and I were just chatting before we got on. Um, the last time I presented for Ohio State was in 2020, just prior to the pandemic, and I was late. I got the times mixed up in my head, and I've been mortified ever since. And so glad for an opportunity to come back and start on times. So thank you for that. Um, I have I have an hour. I intend to finish this on time as well. So I'm going to move pretty quickly and, and just kind of dive right in. Um, I'm Alex Ellswick. I'm an assistant professor at UK. Um, and I've had the opportunity to learn about addiction from a real wide variety of experiences over the last decade. So um, I started my professional career as a marriage and family therapist learned a lot about mental health disorders and family conflict. I worked for a little while within the treatment system, which I think was a really valuable experience, both because I learned what it looks like when treatment is done right and when treatment is done not so right. Um, and I also learned in that experience that I'm not a very good therapist. I have a couple of anxiety disorders as I'll share with you in a minute. So I learned that really wasn't the job for me sitting in like, a uh, perfect therapeutic silence with a complete stranger is not a comfortable thing for someone like me. So I went on and got my doctorate. It's uh, much more comfortable for me to hide behind a Zoom screen and do this kind of thing. So um, I'm also the co-founder of Voices. I don't think I have another chance to talk about Voices. So I'll just say quickly, we're a recovery community organization and our goal is to build recovery capital um, for the folks we serve. And hopefully that'll make a lot more sense to you by the end of today. Um, so I have all these experiences of clinical experience and on the ground service provision and research and you put them all together and it's a great mixture, but without a doubt, the most valuable experience I have is personal experience and I, I never want to miss an opportunity to reduce stigma and to, to, to frame some of this, this discussion around my own experience. So I'm going to start by sharing some of that and then we'll kind of dive into um, the real focus of our time today. And I did you all a real service because I included pictures, which I don't always do. I, I'm not sure if I did that last time I was at Ohio State, but this will give you a real sense of uh, young Alex. So I was born and raised here in Lexington, Kentucky, to really fortunate circumstances. Um, my dad's a doctor. My mom's an accountant. 
nothing bad ever happened to me as a kid. I wasn't neglected or abused. Parents didn't divorce. No adverse childhood experiences. But I inherited a few risk factors for addiction, um, a genetic predisposition. There's a lot of addiction in my extended family. Um, and also starting about the age of 12, um, I started to struggle with symptoms of anxiety. And it's funny because I was just reflecting on this with a friend of mine not long ago. If you had used my first 12 years of life and extrapolated that into the future, you would have said Alex is going to have the easy breeziest life of all time. Uh, I was really happy, really well adjusted for the first probably 12 years. And then with puberty and adolescence and all the cascading hormonal changes that come with that, I got some chemical imbalances along the way. And I ended up being diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, and trichotillomania, which is a hair pulling disorder. Um, but I didn't get those diagnoses until I was 22 and at my second treatment center. So I spent like 10 years of my life struggling against anxiety, not really knowing how to cope with it. And I found drugs and alcohol. Um, I experimented in a way that's sort of developmentally appropriate at not too early of an age. Um, but I found that drugs were a really effective way um, to treat my anxiety in the short term. And for want of something better, some, some meaningful clinical care, um, that's what I did. And so um, I ended up having the chance to, go, to play college baseball. And as I moved into college, and so my social anxiety went way through the roof. I'm, I'm uniquely bad at building new relationships. It's a kind of part of the way that my social anxiety manifests. Um, I'm much more comfortable with people once we already have established sort of the guidelines of our relationship. Um, so, so forming new relationships was just a challenge for me. And as my anxiety went up, my, my cannabis use went up and um, somewhere along the way, I started selling drugs as a way to support my, my habit. And on Valentine's day, 2010, that's, that's young Alex, by the way. Um, I think it's possible that I'm holding up a gang sign there, but I don't really know. I was not a part of a gang. So don't worry. I just thought I was really cool. Um, and on Valentine's Day 2010, I got pulled over because my brake light was out and I got arrested on a bunch of felony drug trafficking charges. And I went to jail and had a bad experience in jail and got kicked off the baseball team and kicked out of the college. And um, about two months later, I had surgery to have wisdom teeth removed and I got prescribed oxycodone. And I took it as prescribed. I didn't abuse it, but I ended up getting um, a second script for oxycodone. I took it as prescribed and, and I ended up getting addicted. And to keep a long story short, because I have so much more that I want to get to with you all, um, addiction took me all the bad places that people go. Um, I went in and out of jail. I went on and off the street. I went in and out of treatment. Um, I ended up spending time homeless in a few different cities, in Nashville, Tennessee, in Lexington, Kentucky, in Cincinnati, Ohio. And I spent the very end of my addiction sleeping under this bridge. This is the Highway 35 uh, overpass that runs through downtown Dayton, Ohio. And I met a community of folks who were homeless and IV drug users, and they introduced me to um, what, you know, they taught me uh, where to go to get a meal. And, and where to go to get a shower. Um, and they, they introduced me to a Salvation Army, which is essentially a homeless shelter that had a treatment component. This is the day that I got dropped off at the Salvation Army. Um, really miserable, really in a bad place. Uh, it's hard to appreciate that just from that photograph, but just in a bad place. And um, I, I gotta tell you the first 30 days at the Salvation Army are the worst 30 days of my whole life. It's um, a lot easier being out there under a bridge than it is being early in recovery. There's, there's a, a neuroscientific explanation, a, a neurological basis for that, but it's just really, really miserable. Um, but I stayed and I ended up staying six months. And really, I wanted to fast forward the story to tell you this last piece, because it's most relevant to what we're going to discuss today, which is when I left the Salvation Army, I left with all these barriers that are characteristic of a person leaving treatment or leaving incarceration because I had bad credit and I had lots of debt, and I had a criminal record, and I had no college degree, and I had no marketable skills, and I was the least employable person in the state of Kentucky. I got on food stamps. I was disqualified from many forms of supportive housing by virtue of the fact that I had a drug trafficking charge. I really didn't know what I was going to do. But this is a really critical uh, juncture in, in my recovery, where I had a different experience than the vast majority of of other people who have substance use disorders. And it has everything to do with my privilege and my access 
to the things that I needed, what we call recovery capital, because most people in my position, my buddy Jason, for instance, who um, coincidentally, I was just texting with a second ago, graduated the Salvation Army. And um, after six months of doing the hardest work of his life, he didn't have the same family support or financial support for a down payment on an apartment or a halfway house or a supportive recovery residence. So instead, he had to continue his recovery at the Gateway Shelter, which is the shelter in Dayton where folks are, are shooting heroin. And we don't need to be addiction recovery experts to surmise, hey, that's not a real conducive environment for my friend to recover. And what I want you all to know is that I was spared that. I was spared uh, the indignity of having to continue my recovery in a homeless shelter. But more importantly, I was spared the psychosocial stress associated with trying to rebuild my life from a homeless shelter, right? You can imagine the barriers that people would face in that experience. And, I, and I, I want you to know that I was spared that not because I'm better than Jason and not because I'm smarter than Jason and not because I worked harder than Jason or I, because I wanted my recovery more than Jason or whatever sort of moralistic narrative we like to spin around recovery. The reality is I had more access to the things that I needed. The reality is my dad had a relationship at a church in Lexington. And because of my dad's relationship, the pastor let me sleep at the parsonage for free. I didn't have to pay a dime. You can imagine the, the incredible amount of stress that was reduced for me early in recovery when my housing was provided for me. And then most people in my position, they're, they're graduating a treatment center or they're leaving incarceration and they've got to pound the pavement and they've got, got to submit applications to jobs that in recovery sometimes we say are humbling, but in reality, many of them are humiliating. And that's not a knock on any type of work. That's just to say there are lots of people in recovery with loads of potential. And they want to be doctors and lawyers and policymakers, but because of the stigma imposed by society at large, it gets internalized into this self-limiting belief that says, you know, I'm a, I'm a junkie and um, all, all that's in my future is to, to flip burgers. And I was spared that experience. I was spared the, the stress associated with trying to rebuild my life and maintain my recovery on $7.50 an hour. And, and more importantly, I was spared the indignity and, and the stress, the psychosocial stress associated with that experience. My, and it's not because I'm better than Jason. It's not because I, I worked harder than him or made better decisions or sacrificed more or wanted my recovery more or loved my family more. It's simply because my dad's a doctor. My dad's a doctor and he had a patient who heard about my experience and he said, what the heck, let's give him a job. And he gave me a job that I didn't earn. I didn't earn it by merit. I didn't deserve it. But then when I had a job, I had health insurance. And then when I had health insurance, I could see a therapist. And then when I could see a therapist, I could address my anxiety. And so all these resources, they just built and they built. And I think of them like scaffolding, building on each other. And there are these resources that, that surrounded me and insulated me from the stress that would threaten my recovery. And so when I got to graduate school and I started asking the question, why me? Why is it that I've been to so many funerals, so many of my friends are dead, so many of my friends are still active in their addiction? Why did I find a way out? Because I know it isn't because I am braver or smarter or whatever that is. I know it's because I had access to more. And, and I started to see that not just in my experience, but also in the research. And that stuff is called recovery capital. And so we're going to spend a lot of the rest of our time today really focusing on why this, these resources are so meaningful and also why they shouldn't be an afterthought why aftercare is not an afterthought, why, why it really needs to be the first thought. Um, but before I do, just because I showed you all my shame, I wanna show you a little bit of my pride as well. Um, in the first couple months uh, or year really out of treatment, I had a lot of rebuilding to do with my family. And so every Wednesday we would meet at Waffle House at the, at the awful waffle and we would have, uh, have breakfast and reconnect. And my mom is wearing a shirt that says resting brunch face because she's just a really cool mom. And uh, it was just a really valuable thing for us to, to get to reconnect on our own terms. This is our staff at Voices of Hope at our annual Overdose Awareness Day event about 2018. And today we have more than 100 staff and all of our staff are people in recovery who use their lived experience to help other people in recovery. So it's created this really wild self-sustaining ecology of people in recovery, helping people in recovery. It's the coolest thing in the world. Um, and then the last one I'll share with you, I, I'm just bragging at this point, but this is the highlight of my existence. I got the chance to do a panel discussion about this very topic, about recovery capital, with some of my heroes. So that's Dr. Nora Volkow, the director of NIDA, 
um, Sharon Walsh, who's the director of our Center for Drug and Alcohol Research at UK, and then Dr. Francis Collins, who's the director of National Institutes for Health. So just a really cool experience. And I think it speaks to the importance, the weight of, of what we're here to discuss today. So no impressive segue, we're just gonna jump straight in. Um, but, but before we get to recovery capital, I wanna start by framing everything around the brain because reminding us at its core, when we're talking about substance use disorder, we're talking about a brain disorder, a chronic brain disorder. And so you all are well aware that this is not your brain on drugs, but this is a slightly more accurate depiction of your brain on drugs. I'm not gonna do a whole 30 minutes on your brain. I just wanted to remind us what PET scans like this show, um, if, if you're not familiar with PET scans, we're looking at dopamine activity in the brain. So if I were to describe in the shortest way possible what's happening in terms of chronic drug use in the brain, um, it, in the short term, drug use causes a spike in dopamine, hence the euphoria, the high that people experience. But over time, our brains don't like um, those spikes. Even though it's euphoria, our brain doesn't like all that volatility. So the brain kind of compensates and stops producing as much dopamine. And it's called dopamine downregulation. And it leads to the point of this phenomenon called anhedonia, which is one of my favorite words. An means not, and hedonia means pleasure. So it's referring to a brain that's unable to derive pleasure from the world around it. And that's really a great way to characterize the addicted brain. It's so downregulated of dopamine as a consequence of prolonged drug use that now it really can't experience pleasure on its own. So the brain on the left is a healthy control. The brain in the middle looks identical to an addicted brain, but here's the catch. And here's why I chose to show you this slide. That brain in the middle is not actually a, a PET scan of an addicted brain. That's actually the brain of someone who was addicted to methamphetamine and they're now 30 days abstinent. So for the sake of argument, we can all imagine this is someone who's just left 30 days of incarceration or 30 day treatment center. And they've probably had a graduation from their 30-day treatment center, right? When, when graduation suggests that you're finished, you're done. And here's the problem. This person has not really even yet begun their recovery. They may have walked out of the 30-day treatment center 30 days abstinent, and they may have more weight on their body and more weight in their face, and they may, may be stating all of their best intentions, but the reality is this is an utterly compromised brain, an utterly addicted brain that's going to make compromised choices. So that's the disappointing part. We have a, a treatment apparatus that's set up to address a chronic disorder, and yet it treats it in acute bits. And it's a big problem, um, especially when aftercare is an afterthought. Here's the hopeful part. The brain on the far right is the brain of someone who was addicted to methamphetamine. Now they're two years abstinent. And what you notice is that brain much more nearly approximates the healthy control brain. That brain is beginning to heal in a meaningful way. That's a person who's not compromised um, in terms of their decision-making, right? Um, what this suggests, I, the reason I just wanted to start our discussion here today is to remind us uh, substance use disorder is a chronic disorder, long-term disorder. Treatment centers may be necessary as a period of crisis stabilization. They are in no way the, the be-all end-all answer to addressing substance use disorder. So let's dive into recovery capital. Um, starting with the figure on the right, Think about any, I, I think to simplify the term, think about any time you've ever heard the term capital. So financial capital, social capital, it's always a reference to resources. So recovery capital is recovery resources, really broadly defined. We're, we're, it's a way of zooming out away from a treatment center and, and really looking at holistically at a human being and saying, what are all of the needs that must be met in order for you to sustain recovery? And I like to put recovery capital up next to um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I'm assuming many of you all are familiar with this. Maslow, it's pretty foundational sociological theory. And Maslow said, in order to reach your full potential, which is interesting because by the way, I can't remember if I have this slide on a definition or this definition on a slide later or not, but SAMHSA's definition of recovery uses exactly that language, reaching your full potential. So in many ways, you can think of Maslow's hierarchy as a hierarchy of recovery, right? And, and importantly, what Maslow said is not just that needs must be met, but that me needs must be met in order. In other words, we all know this. This is sort of intuitive. Um, you can't begin to build a child's self-esteem if they don't have food in their stomach that morning, right? There, there's something about that that I think is intuitive to all of us. 
when I was homeless and flying a sign on the side of the road, you wouldn't have pulled up next to me and said, hey, buddy, you just need some self-esteem. You know, there's something really offensive about that. What I needed at that time was some food and some water and some shelter, et cetera. So this is all pretty intuitive. I like to start discussion of recovery capital here because most of us can, can agree at this point and there's nothing revelatory yet. We go, okay, yeah, people have needs that must be met in order for them to recover, sure. But here's the big catch. Um, well, first, how does recovery capital work? Let me say that. How does recovery capital lead to recovery or remission? In simple terms, by reducing stress. And when we say stress, we don't mean just, I had a stressful day at the office. We mean meaningful biopsychosocial stress, right? Um, the kind of stress that's reduced by improving your housing or improving food security or um, improving your relationship or leaving an abusive relationship. Or, I mean, you can think of any number of things that would meaningfully reduce stress in a person's life that would increase their odds of recovery. That's recovery capital, okay? But here's the catch. The catch is when, when do we start building recovery capital for people? When should we start improving their housing or their mental health or their relationships? Should we do it right now today, as soon as we uh, can engage with them? Or should we wait until they're abstinent? And I wanna argue today, and you all can decide kind of uh, amongst yourselves to, to the extent to which this is true for your community. Although I would guess being neighbors that it's very similar. Um, I, wanna, I wanna suggest that in my community, we've decided that people need to be abstinent first in order to access these resources. We've decided that um, abstinence is a precondition to access many forms of recovery capital. And so I'll give you just a few examples, but uh, just for the sake of time, I'm gonna have to leave some out. Um, the, the, the imminent example is housing. Uh, there is no housing for people who use drugs, for people who have substance use disorders in my community. We don't have harm reduction housing. We don't even really have emergency shelters for people who use drugs because the requirement of those shelters is that they be drug and alcohol free. We have sober living in my community, but that's not a place where people can go to become sober. It's only a place where you can live if you are already abstinent. And by the way, even if you were abstinent at the time you walked into the door of that sober living, let's say that in two, three, four days, uh, your, your substance use disorder, which is by its very nature, a chronic disorder, becomes symptomatic and you use a drug because that's what you do with a chronic disease, right? You know what's gonna happen? We're gonna kick you out of our so-called supportive housing. Um, we, we demand abstinence first. So then what we do is we kick somebody out of housing at precisely the time that they need housing the most when they're experiencing a return to use. We do the same with caregiving, with the advice that we give families. And I wanna be really careful here and really clear that I am not here to criticize family members at all. I have no interest in doing that. Really what I'm here to criticize, I suppose, is the, the poor guidance that we've given family members that's not based on data or evidence because we tell family members, your loved ones need to hit rock bottom in order to recover. And what we mean by that is we need to deprive them of the many needs that they have, of access to food and shelter and love and connection and all the things that you can think in order to expedite a plummet to a so-called rock bottom, which some of us, I guess, believe is sort of fertile ground for recovery. And the problem with that would be um, that my friends are dying. And that I've been to more funerals than weddings and I'm 31 years old and that's not normal. And it's because the concept of rock bottom is predicated at least in part on Alcoholics Anonymous, the text for which was written in the early 1930s and which is entirely focused on the cessation of alcohol use, which is a, which is a different drug with a different risk profile. We're in a different place today. We do the same with mental health services. And I know this from firsthand experience because the clinic where I was trained had a policy that said, if um, even if the primary presenting problem that a family came with to our clinic, even if the primary problem wasn't drugs or alcohol, if drugs or alcohol were a problem mentioned at all, they had to show evidence that they completed a treatment center before we would begin to work with them in family counseling. And you know that the net effect of that was not that people went to treatment and then came to us for therapy. The net effect of that was people didn't get access to therapy. And we denied people access to family services, which all of the research would say would improve the recovery outcomes for this individual, would improve the family functioning for this family. And we denied them access because we believed they needed to be abstinent first. And perhaps the most absurd example of this 
uh, was first pointed out almost 20 years ago by William White, who's my favorite addiction thinker. And the paper was, was I'm, I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it was something to the effect of, um, it's time to stop kicking people out of addiction treatment. And basically what he argued was, um, hey, this is the only disorder for which I'm aware that a person can be kicked out of treatment for displaying symptoms of the disorder for which they are being treated. So when you think about it, when I go to treatment, what I'm doing is I'm implicitly acknowledging that I don't have control over my drug and alcohol use. If I did, then by definition, I wouldn't be addicted and I wouldn't be coming to treatment, right? So I'm unable to control my drug and alcohol use. And let's say a day or a week later, indeed, I'm unable to control my drug and alcohol use and I use a pill or I take a drink, probably what's gonna be, happen is I'm gonna be kicked out of treatment, right? Despite the fact that two days ago, I acknowledged, yeah, that's the nature of my problem. I can't control my drug and alcohol use. There's something that's on its face seems a little bit backwards about that. And then more recently, abstinence has become preconditioned to be accepted by the recovery community writ large. Um, for so many of my friends in recovery, abstinence is synonymous with recovery um, to the extent that people who take any pathway to recovery that is not abstinence-based are marginalized and they're stigmatized and they're treated as if their recovery is less than or not legitimate, even though what they're experiencing is by all indications, a full meaningful kind of recovery. So these are all just some examples to get you thinking. What I wanna to suggest today is, is if you're a, a single, not a single story, if you're a, a rock bottom subscriber, if you're a person who believes that in earnest, then you may not be a person who believes in Maslow's hierarchy because it kind of seems like you got Maslow upside down. And I don't say that to be, to be offensive um, or to be confrontational, only to, to, to get us all to take a look at this. Because essentially what we're saying when we demand abstinence first is that we want people to, to, to recover without the benefit of all of these resources that research says would promote recovery. So we deny access to recovery resources in the interest of abstinence. It doesn't make sense. We're doing it backwards, right? So here's some thoughts from a couple of experts. Keith Humphreys was the advisor um, from the National Office of Drug Control Policy to the Obama White House. And he said, it's remarkable that people believe what's needed is more punishment. If punishment worked, nobody would be addicted. It's a pretty punishing experience. Um, and then William White, describing the moment he understood what was wrong with the rock bottom concept, his colleague said to him, Bill, you're not getting it. My clients don't hit bottom. My clients live on the bottom. Their capacities for physical and emotional pain are beyond your comprehension. If we wait for them to hit bottom, they will die. The issue of engaging them is not an absence of pain, it's an absence of hope. Um, every single day, we work with folks in Lexington at Voices of Hope who experience chronic homelessness, folks who've been homeless for 5, 10, 15 years. And there is something patently absurd, to me at least, about the suggestion that they need more pain and suffering, that that's the thing that they need in order to recover, um, that they need to be deprived of more in order to recover. That just doesn't add up in my head. So I wanna give you a couple of other examples that come from my own experience. And the first is my best friend. And I share this with permission. His name's Bobby. We grew up on the same street, had many of the same experiences, but Bobby had an experience that I did not have related to gun violence. And as a consequence of that, he has some pretty severe PTSD, um, probably some other accompanying anxiety disorders that he's never really gotten a handle on in any meaningful way. He's never been engaged in care long enough to do that. Trauma is not something that we typically resolve very quickly. Um, and I wanna just give you an example of what happened. So he caught a charge for his drug use. And we already know in, in large part, he's using drugs as a way of dealing with this gun violence. Um, he caught a charge and he was offered drug court or a year in county. And he told me, I'm ready to do the year in county. And we all agree that a year in county jail is not the best thing that's going to support Bobby, that's going to support his recovery, that's going to give him a better chance on the other side. It's going to create more barriers for him. And so um, I worked really hard to, to make sure that Bobby could get into drug court because I wanted to make sure he was actually getting something therapeutic, something meaningful. But here's the problem. Drug court's only focus is abstinence, not other indications of recovery, not looking at well-being, not looking at his mental or physical health, the key indicator for drug court is whether or not he's putting drugs in his body. 
And so what happened was every time that Bobby would test positive on his urinalysis, he would be sent to treatment. And the problem with that is not that there's anything inherently wrong with treatment. The problem with that is when he goes to a treatment center, he's being ripped away from his primary therapist. So he never had an opportunity to sit in a continuum of care, to be in the process of recovery, right? To be in process, which is nonlinear and fits and starts and certainly not defined or characterized by perfect abstinence. What he needed was some time to be in process. And instead, every time he tested positive, he was punished for it. And eventually, when he tested positive enough times, he was ripped out of drug court and he went to serve that year in county, even though he had already lost the last three months of his life trying in drug court. It's an example. It's just one example of what happens when the judicial system becomes more myopically focused on abstinence than on the, the full recovery of this individual who has more holistic needs. Another example I saw firsthand comes from MOUD providers. So medications for opioid use disorder, buprenorphine, methadone. Um, I worked at an at a outpatient treatment provider um, that offered buprenorphine. And on more than one occasion, I saw a person who had a severe opioid use disorder. They were injecting heroin six times a day and they get on buprenorphine and their life is stabilized and remarkably quickly, their life is stabilized and they're you know, employed and their health is under control and they're pursuing custody of their kids and things are really headed in the right direction. And maybe they go through a stressful experience and they test positive for THC. And for a time, at least, we had a zero tolerance, abstinence-based policy. And so what the providers would do is kick them out of the clinic, say that they would violated the terms of their contract, and the person would overdose and die that night for want of buprenorphine. It's an example of what happens when we're more myopically focused on abstinence than we are on recovery, on the actual health and wellness of the individual we're seeking to help. And the last example comes from families. Again, I say this with as much grace as I can muster. I want people to be gracious of my family and the way they tried to help me. And I wanna be gracious to other family members. I think we're all trying our best. What I'm being critical of is the poor guidance that we've given family members. Because we told family members, your loved ones have to hit rock bottom and abstinence is the only goal. And so I have a family friend who's pretty well to do, sort of like I was, uh, am, and, she had the opportunity to go to a treatment center that had a family week, which as a family therapist, I'm a big advocate for, right? Involve the family system in care. And as a part of family week, they encouraged them to draw up a contingency contract. The contract said in order for her to live in her parents' home after treatment, she needed to be abstinent. And if there were any indications that she were not abstinent, then she would be kicked out of the house. And about a week after she left the treatment center, um, she'd been abstinent of heroin for, you know, five weeks or however long it had been. And her mom caught her smoking a bowl of cannabis in the garage. And to hear her tell it, she would tell you, even though it felt wrong in her gut, she kicked her daughter out because that's what the contract said should be done. And her daughter overdosed and, and passed away that night. And I don't offer these examples to be exploitative. I really don't have any interest in that either, but to give you some clear indication that, the, that I'm not just pontificating about something academic. This manifests in a very real way, in a way that's impacting my friends. Um, this is what it looks like when we demand abstinence immediately and now, and we don't allow people to be in the process of working through their trauma or their mental disorders or whatever it may take to be in recovery. It's like telling someone who has 100 pounds to lose, if you're not willing to lose 100 pounds this month, don't try, it's not worth it, come back when you're willing. Instead of saying, hey, isn't there something meaningful for you to lose 10 pounds this month and get started in the right direction? It's a process. Okay, so recovery capital, what is it? Um, recovery capital really originates with, with William Cloud who was studying college students. And I think that's really important to note because college students, especially in the 1960s, were a rather privileged swath of society. So he's studying college students and he noticed two things about the college students he was studying that's really noteworthy. First, he noticed that they were recovering at a higher rate than the general population. And he thought there's something curious about that. He also noticed that his college students were recovering without any formal intervention whatsoever. So they were sort of not going to treatment, not going to AA, not going to therapy. They were just graduating college, getting jobs, buying houses, getting married, building lives. 
And he started to form this idea that it had to do with the social capital that they had access to. And then he meets Robert Granfield and they write this really important paper. It's this really important paper that I think no one's ever heard of, right? So it's called The Elephant No One Sees, Natural Recovery Among Middle-Class Addicts. Um, the elephant in the room that Granfield and Cloud are pointing out is natural recovery, is this phenomenon, this entire swath of the population who is recovering from substance use disorder without any formal intervention, none whatsoever, many of whom have severe substance use disorders. And they're recovering without any, any formal help. And they're like, hey, this is a phenomenon we should pay attention to. And so if that blows your mind, it blew my mind the first time I read about natural recovery, because all that I had been exposed to, the stories that I'd been told about addiction were stories about people who had severe SUD, went to treatment, and then got abstinent. And that's the, that's the trajectory I, I'd known. It turns out not only is natural recovery a phenomenon, it is the phenomenon. It is the rule and not the exception in recovery. Natural recovery is also called unassisted recovery. It's sometimes also called spontaneous remission, but I really don't like that term because it's misleading. Spontaneous remission would suggest that people are just sort of all of, all of a sudden, spontaneously out of the blue, just going, hey, I don't wanna use drugs anymore. And that's not what's happening. What's happening is people are recovering naturally and they're recovering naturally, why? precisely to the extent that they have access to recovery capital. Because it turns out that recovery capital is so meaningful. It's not just saying, hey, people need resources. What we're saying is these resources, housing, mental health services, relationships, these resources are so significant that they can preclude the need for treatment entirely. And in fact, do preclude the need for treatment for most people with substance use disorders. That's why recovery capital Aftercare can't be an afterthought. That's why we can't marshal all of our resources into getting people into treatment and then figuring out the rest later. That's a really bad design for a chronic disease. So it turns out 46% of people with substance use disorder recover without any formal intervention, no formal treatment, no therapy, no AA, and 75% of people with alcohol use disorders recover naturally. Right? So recovery capital is actually really important, and it's really important now, today, not after someone gets abstinent or when or hopefully. So let's take just a step back from recovery capital and think about the way that we've addressed addiction over the last 50 years or so in this country. Uh, really starting in 1914 with the, the Harrison Narcotics Act, but especially in 1971 with the de declaration of a war on drugs. We, we waged a war on drugs. And when you do that, you wage a war on people who use drugs. And so what we got for our efforts was, um, you know, a prison industrial complex and mass incarceration. And we are currently mired in the worst drug epidemic of all time, right? So it wasn't a very effective strategy. Um, then beginning about 2000 to 2010, what some people call the age of the brain, we started to understand more about addiction as a chronic brain disorder. And so we started to see the advent of specialty courts, treatment courts, and mental health courts, and uh, drug courts, and recovery courts, and veterans courts, and all of these are like progressive alternatives to incarceration, and at least a tacit acknowledgement that, hey, this is a disorder, and people need treatment. And, 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 and make no mistake, this is a step in the right direction, but I wanna argue that this is basically the system, the model that we have today. The model that we have today, treatment is very, it's very treatment centric. Treatment is very much the focus. A, a goal for so many organizations we work with is just getting people to the doors of a treatment center, which I think is a very short-sighted goal. Where we wanna go, um, well, let me put it this way. So in this first iteration in the war on drugs, we tried to address addiction in jail cells. In the second iteration, we've tried to address addiction in treatment centers. Where we wanna go, I wanna to argue towards what are called recovery-oriented systems of care. Now, instead of the focus being in a jail cell or in a treatment center, now the focus is at home. The focus is right at home where you live. So instead of trying to intensively provide you with resources during 30 days at a stay apart from where you live, the real focus here is how do we provide the recovery capital to you right at home where you live? And so you notice treatment is still a really important component here. Please, especially if there are like treatment providers on the call, please don't hear me saying uh, that treatment isn't important. It's vitally important. It was vitally important for me. But 
it isn't, it's an acute solution to a chronic disease. So it isn't sufficient in and of itself. And as we've shown, it isn't necessary for all people. It's a component. Um, housing is a component. You see all the recovery capital surrounding somebody. Um, so let me give you my analogy for this. <clears throat> my first job in treat, um, after I got out of treatment the last time, um, the one that my dad got for me uh, was working in a tobacco field. I told people that I was doing tobacco research because the researchers were, but honestly, I was just digging holes. All right. And um, I, I was a suburban kid. I'd never been in a greenhouse and really interesting experience the first time I went in a greenhouse because I noticed that it was this perfect environment where the plants would just grow and thrive. And they had all this access to air quality control and water and nutrients and sunlight, and they would shoot up. And when they'd reached kind of a sufficient level of maturation, we would take the trays and load them into a trailer, drive them out to a field, and we would set the tobacco. And if we set the tobacco in good soil that had plenty of sunlight and not too much rainfall, the, the plants would, would transition almost effortlessly. But if we set them in bad soil, like one year we sat it in a low lying area that held too much water and all the plants just wilted and died, right? So this is my analogy for the difference between treatment and recovery. And it's a really, really important distinction between the two. Treatment is like a greenhouse. It's a climate controlled environment for recovery. It's like, I don't, Fort Knox is a Kentucky reference because that's where we keep all the gold. It's in Kentucky. But I think of, of treatment centers as Fort Knox for recovery capital because you've got all the recovery capital in the world. You've got educated counselors and you've got peer support and you've got 12 step meetings and you've got structure to your day and nutritious meals and structured housing and all of the ingredients are there for you. And it's no wonder that people grow and thrive while they're in treatment. Treat, pe people are, are, are tremendously successful at leaving treatment abstinent and in their recovery process. The problem is when their brains are not at a sufficient level of maturation, if you like, um, when their brains haven't sufficiently healed, we're releasing them back into the community. We're treating aftercare as an afterthought for people who already have compromised brains. And then when they use a drug, um, we, we blame them for it and we shame them and we tell them, you know, they, they love drugs more than their kids, um, which just isn't fair. It's just not fair. Um, it doesn't make sense that we would provide for people all this wonderful recovery capital and treatment, and then after 30 days, ask them to leave it all behind. Because that's what's happening on day 31, you've got someone who still has a brain that's very much compromised, and they're reintegrating back into their community, and they're leaving behind all of the resources that would, that would help them, right? Um, it's not that there's anything wrong with treatment, it's just too brief. That's really all that I'm saying. And so the solution is, how do we, how do we make treatment less intensive and more extensive? How do we make treatment match the chronicity of addiction? And, and that's what Recovery Capital aims to do. And with the remainder of my time, I wanna make a case for the connection between recovery capital and harm reduction. And in part, I wanted to do this because I've, I've just perceived a little bit in my work, especially in some Kentucky communities, that in some places, harm reduction has become a dirty word. Uh, has some negative connotations. And I really just wanted to use this opportunity to maybe provide um, kind of a different thought on the matter. We wanna be providing access to all of these forms of recovery capital within the context, context of harm reduction and not just harm reduction in the practical sense. So first of all, let's just start with the figure on the right. Harm reduction is something that we all do every single day. I guarantee in one way or another, already at uh, 11 a.m., we've all done something that relates to harm reduction. So when I drove to the gym this morning, you know, every time I get behind the wheel of a car, there's an inherent risk of harm. But that's that, I'm not going to jog 10 miles to get to my gym. It's not going to happen. So instead, I'm going to wear my seatbelt. I'm going to mostly observe the speed limits, right? And these are ways that I keep myself safe. These are ways that I reduce the harm associated with driving behavior. I'm also pretty fair skinned. I wish I wasn't, but I am, and I like to play golf. And I am not gonna let the fact that I am fair skinned prevent me from playing golf. I'm just gonna wear sunscreen, right? That's a way that we reduce harm. I think the quintessential example is, is, is birth control and abstinence-based sex education. I'm hoping that most of us are aware that abstinence-based sex education was a pretty wild failure. 
And um, we, we, we finally said, you know, it's an uncomfortable fact that um, teenagers might want to have sex, but while it's uncomfortable, it's a fact. And so we have to start living in that reality and reducing the attendant harm. We haven't done the same with drugs and alcohol. We still have drug and alcohol prevention that doesn't offer kids any meaningful examination of what drugs are or why people use them. We simply say drugs are bad, drugs are bad, right? Um, before I get off on a tangent, I got too much to do. So harm reduction, there's, there's really two different kinds of harm reduction, uppercase and lowercase harm reduction. Lowercase harm reduction is probably the harm reduction most of you are familiar with. The practical strategies aimed at reducing the, the consequences associated with substance use. So naloxone, syringe service programs, safe consumption sites, there's, the list goes on and on, right, of these practical strategies that reduce harm. But harm reduction, you may be less familiar with, capital harm reduction is a movement. It's a social justice movement built on a belief in and a respect for the rights of people who use drugs. And what we mean by that is not that we believe everyone should just have the right to use drugs as they wish. What we mean is at the point that a person begins using drugs, they don't relinquish their human rights. So first I wanna talk about the value of harm reduction from lowercase HR perspective. And then I'm gonna give you the, the, the argument that I really wanna give you about capital harm reduction. So I'm just giving you the example of syringe service programs. So you all may be aware that in Scott County, Indiana, sometime circa like 2014, there was um, uh, an HIV outbreak and um, of epidemic proportions. And so the CDC commissioned a study to identify the counties all across the United States that are at the highest risk of experiencing the next HIV outbreak. And they identified 220 counties across the United States and 55 of them are in my state of Kentucky. And probably, uh, as you can tell by the map, another large share of them are also in your state in Ohio and in West Virginia. Um, we, my state, Kentucky, has the highest incidence of um, hepatitis C in addition. So we have a real vested interest in lowercase harm reduction, practical, practical harm reduction. So as an example, syringe service programs um, do a lot of different things, but to be really clear, their primary goal is to reduce the spread of disease. And that's what they do really, really, really well at a population level. Um, they offer many other benefits, but they reduce the incidence of HIV and hep C. They reduce injection frequency and injection site wound frequency, increase entry to treatment. This is the one, you know, the, one of the arguments I always hear about syringe service programs is that we're enabling, we're enabling drug use. But it surprises people to find that someone who engages with a syringe service program is more likely to enter treatment than someone who doesn't. We're also able to increase access to recovery capital physical and mental health care, reduce the number of improperly discarded syringes in our communities, reduce first responder needle sticks. There are lots of advantages, right? And so usually when we, when we describe the advantages of harm reduction, we stop there and we say, hey, look, here are some really practical advantages. Here are some ways that harm reduction allows us to reduce disease, et cetera, et cetera. But today I wanna, with the rest of my 10 minutes here, I really wanna make the case for uppercase harm reduction and why it's really valuable in a different sense. And in order to do that, I got to put up these stages of change. I'm hoping that most of you all are familiar. If you're not, it's okay. I think it's pretty intuitive. Prochesca and Di Clemente were these researchers who said, look, in order for anyone to change any kind of behavior, you want to lose weight, you want to quit smoking, you want to gossip less, I don't know, whatever it is, um, you have to go through these stages. And there are these pretty characteristic stages that we see when we're trying to change any behavior. So when we're looking at a substance use disorder, Pre-contemplation, we see that's a lot of times what gets tagged as denial. Um, that's someone who maybe has a DUI. They have a lot of the signs and symptoms of a substance use disorder, but they're really convinced that they don't. As the name would suggest, pre-contemplation, before I'm even thinking that I have a problem. And then contemplation, you sort of move into this place that I would describe more as ambivalence. And this is a really awful place to be when you have a substance use disorder because you're beginning to really weigh the consequences of your use and to face them, but you're really not ready to do anything about it yet. It's a, it's a horrible place to be. Um, and then preparation is when you gear up to do something about it. Action is when you take action and go to treatment or see a therapist or do whatever the thing is. 
and maintenance would be like long-term recovery, maintaining the change. So the reason why I did all that is not because I want to teach you something, but because it helps to make this point about uppercase harm reduction and, and why it's so valuable. When we use the approach that we're currently using today, where we demand abstinence first, abstinence as a precondition for all things, abstinence only treatment, the entire treatment apparatus set up as abstinence only. You have to be abstinent the day you walk in. You have to desire abstinence the day you walk in. When we do that, we can only be effective with people who are right here. So if you want to imagine on this spectrum, we could locate everyone in your community and mine who has a substance use disorder. Everyone exists somewhere on this spectrum. And yet the only people who are going to be fit to go to treatment under our current treatment system are people who are ready and willing for abstinence today. And it turns out it's a pretty small sliver of all the people with substance use disorders. The value of harm reduction is not only does it in a practical sense reduce the associated harms, but the bigger value is that it allows us to connect with people all across the spectrum. It allows us to engage with people right where they are. So you may have heard the tagline for harm reduction is meeting people where they're at. And this is what we mean by meeting people where they are. It means that instead of saying, come back when you're ready, which is so often what our treatment apparatus says to our folks, my friends who are suffering, come back when you're ready. A lot of my friends may not be ready for abstinence today, but they're definitely ready for health and wellness. They're definitely ready for connection, for belongingness, for support, for love. They're ready for a whole lot of things that would help them that can't be offered under the current treatment apparatus. What harm reduction, HR, capital HR, harm reduction allows us to do is to engage the unengaged in our communities. And as it turns out, those who are community dwelling with substance use disorders are most people with substance use disorders, right? So um, here's just to kind of drive home the point. When we don't meet people where they are, when we have this abstinence only lens that we've had, we have 23 million people in the United States with substance use disorder and only 2.3 million receive treatment. This is a pretty well-known statistic. I'm, I venture to guess some of you all know this. We call this the treatment gap, right? And so every time we write a grant, we include this statistic on the treatment gap. And we say, look, people who need treatment aren't getting it. But here's the really interesting thing. When you do a deeper dive on that data and you ask those 20, well, the 90% the who are standing in the treatment gap why they didn't receive treatment this year, the majority of them, something like 93% will say it's because they don't think they need treatment. And something like 38% of them will tell you it's because they don't want to be abstinent. And therefore, they don't want to, to take advantage of the exclusively abstinence-based treatment offerings that are being provided to them. So now let me give you a different example, what it looks like when we do meet people where they are. There's a recovery community organization like Voices of Hope in Florida, but they're able to operate a little differently because the regulations are different and they can distribute syringes directly from their brick and mortar. And so I was looking at a paper that Robert Ashford uh, published on them a couple of years ago. And um, just as like a footnote in their demographics, it said 87% of their participants had passed months of substance use. And it made me chuckle because I think to the untrained eye, definitely to the rock bottom subscriber, if you read that, you would think, man, that's a really bad program. Like what an awful program. Everybody's using drugs. Obviously it's not effective. But I think when you, when you do a little deeper dive and you take a little more nuanced lens, you realize that those 87% are people who stand in the treatment gap. So these are folks who, if this RCO didn't exist, and if they weren't doing that good harm reduction work through that harm reduction lens, these folks wouldn't be engaged with anyone. They wouldn't be connected to any kind of care. Instead, they would be on their own isolated suffering in their community, which no doubt all of the research says would exacerbate the outcomes of their substance use. Um, this is my favorite example. I'm gonna kind of close with two examples really quickly of why harm reduction really is a vastly superior kind of approach. And, 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 and just to drive home the point here, so we can meet people where they are all along the spectrum. And part of the value is when I, that means I can work with somebody who's in pre-contemplation or contemplation who's still using they're injecting 10 times a day, and yet I can still engage with them, and I can build a rapport with them, and I can still help them think about their housing, help them think about their employment, help them think about their relationships. I can build recovery capital for them before they get abstinent. And part of the value is not just that it reduces harm, but also that it increases the odds of their recovery, because now they have access to the things that they need to recover, right? 
So this example, um, this is a note that a participant wrote to us. This was a woman who um, is, has a, um, an opioid use disorder. She's injecting heroin. She's experiencing homelessness in Lexington. And she used to walk by our center on a daily basis. And she saw the word recovery out front. And so she was pretty sure that she didn't want anything that we had to offer because she was not interested in stopping her drug use. She was not interested in reducing her drug use, changing her route of administration, none of it. She wanted to keep doing what she was doing. Um, but she heard that we offer laundry services and we don't demand that people pass a drug test in order to access laundry. We don't demand that they be sober or provide any indication that they're sober, graduated treatment center. We just ask that people meet with a recovery coach. That's kind of our low barrier access. And so this, she thought, well, that's kind of a small pit price to pay to save some money to do my laundry. So she would come and put her laundry in. And, and the curious thing was she's on foot. So it's not like she's gonna put her laundry in and drive away, right? Um, so she would put her laundry in and then she would go outside and smoke a cigarette and chat to some participants and then go inside and sit down and talk with the recovery coach a little bit. And even though she had no desire to change her drug use at all, through two, three weeks of interacting with the coach and the participant in the center, she one day came up to the coach right in early 8 a.m. Um, I'd like to go to treatment today. And it's one of my favorite examples. She's more than, she would be five months abstinent today. She's more than five months abstinent today. And it's my favorite story because my goal for anyone is not necessarily abstinence. My goal for you is whatever your goal is. But the great irony and why this is such a good example is because she didn't desire abstinence at all in the beginning. She didn't desire any change at all. And if our focus had been abstinence only, had our response been what is the typical response in this field, which is come back when you're ready to be abstinent, she would still be out there suffering. She wouldn't be connected. The irony is it's precisely because we were more focused on building rapport and connecting with her than we were on abstinence that we were able to get her into abstinence. Um, harm reduction casts a much wider net and it connects people who desperately need to be connected to care. So here's my very last example, and then I'll be quiet. Um, early in our work at Voices of Hope, I, I also share this story to try to just show a little bit of humility because I realize I'm being critical of the system and it's really easy to be a chief critic. I realize it's, it's, um, it's an easy role to play. And I want you to know that I'm guilty of thinking all of these things. I was a rock, rock bottom subscriber all the way. Um, and it's taken me time, you know, it's taken me time. And one of the things that really changed my understanding was this experience that I wanna share with you. So this was way back, probably like 2015 or something, long time ago, a guy came to us. It was before we had a, a formal brick and mortar center and we're gonna call him John. And John said, I would love to get some help with my teeth. He had really bad mental health, but he also had really bad dental health. And he said, I'd like some help with my teeth. And so we said, John, we would love to help you with your teeth but we need to get you abstinent first, right? Because we were still kind of rock bottom subscribers. We still felt like, like um, it wouldn't be, you know, we're not very good stewards of this money if we just give him teeth and we don't ask him to change his behavior. And so we set him up with a treatment center and he wouldn't go. And so you can imagine some of the conversations we're having behind the scenes as providers. They're, they're pretty stigmatizing conversations. Well, I guess John just wasn't willing to do the work, right? I guess he'll come back when he's ready. I guess he'll come back when he's suffered enough. These are all the things that we say as a refrain in my field, right? And a couple of weeks later, John comes back and he says, you know, I really want some help with my teeth. And we're like, John, we would love to help you, bud, but we got to do something about your drug use. You know, it's a problem. And um, so we set him up with a therapist, a, a female colleague of mine, who's a tremendous therapist. I had just met her back then. She's awesome. And he went to one session and he never went again. And so now you really know the conversations that we're having behind the scenes as providers about, well, how many times can we bend over backward for John? Well, if John isn't willing to show up, if John isn't willing to do the work, blah, 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 right? A couple of weeks later, John comes back and says, I want help with my teeth. And um, to be honest, not our proudest moment, but we were just exasperated and we didn't know what to do. So we said, yeah, John, let's, we'll help you with your teeth. And it was the most ridiculous procedure because he had to have some teeth pulled and then he had to have other teeth implanted so that there was something they could affix the dentures to. And it was really a process, really an expensive procedure. And um, John more or less disappeared after he got the procedure. 
And so now you definitely know the conversations that we're having behind the scenes as providers. Well, John got one on us. Guess he got a free set of teeth on us, blah, blah, blah. We see John again about, I, I'm not sure exactly how much longer it had been. It must have been about three months later that John comes into the center one afternoon with the, the biggest, dumbest smile you've ever seen in your life. So happy to show off his teeth. John had been abstinent three months. He'd gone to a 30-day treatment center. And John explained to me maybe the most valuable lesson I've learned doing this work. And that is, John knew something about his life that I didn't. John knew that every time that he opens his mouth and he shows his teeth, he's so self-conscious that he can't even imagine getting vulnerable. So when he goes to a treatment center and he's forced to sit into a circle and try to bare his soul to a bunch of other human beings, he can't do it. There's too much shame in, in, in the way that he presents to the world. He said, and to make matters worse, it's one thing for me to have to sit into a, a circle of a bunch of guys and show my teeth, but the one thing I never wanna have to do is show my teeth to a female. That was just his hang up. He just didn't wanna have to do it. And guess what I did? I set him up with a female therapist because I didn't ask the question, because I didn't let John lead, because I thought that what John needed was abstinence, abstinence now, abstinence for all, right? What John needed was to get his teeth fixed. And he was screaming it at the top of his lungs. Hey man, help me. This is a barrier to my life. This impacts my employability. This impacts, impacts my ability to be housed. This impacts my ability to access mental health services. This impacts every relationship in my life. This is the core of my identity and who I am. And I just thought, hey, I'm the expert. I know better, right? So that was a really humbling experience. And John taught me that um, people who use drugs in many ways really are the experts in their own lives. You know, we take that with a grain of salt, but they really do understand things about their own lived experience and about the barriers they face that we so don't understand. And the reasons why abstinence may not be attainable today and why it much, might be a much more valuable approach to engage someone um, rather than dismiss them and tell them to come back when they're ready. Um, last thing I'm gonna share, and then I swear I'm actually done. I know I'm over time. Um, I heard this wonderful speaker at the Harm Reduction Summit uh, in Kentucky uh, about five years ago. His name was um, Austin Eubanks, and um, it was the greatest speaker I'd ever heard. He was a young guy. He was the CEO of, uh, of a treatment center, and he had on a tailored suit, and he gave this awesome talk about the connection between pain and suffering and addiction, and I was just jealous. I was sitting in the front row green with envy, like, this is the guy I want to be, and that was in April of 2018, I think, and in May I saw um, on the news that Austin Eubanks had overdosed and died at his home in Colorado. And that for me was another humbling experience because it was a reminder of what we mean when we say addiction is a chronic disease. And what we mean is that I'm not done. What we mean is that I, Alex, I have a, a substance use disorder that's chronic. I'm living in recovery today, but that could change tomorrow. So I'm not out here advocating for all my friends to have access to the things that they need. I'm advocating for me to have access to the things that I need tomorrow. You know what I mean? Thank you all. Thank you so much, Alex. I think you'll see in the chat there that we've got quite a lot of feedback and gratitude for your presentation. One of the questions that um, folks shared is, is when you're speaking next. Do you have um, any open to the public coming up? Great question. I would have to look. I don't know off the top of my head, but for what it's worth, this is exactly in my job description. This is like the research translation. This is my favorite part of my job to do. Um, so if I can do it for you or your organization or just connect with you all, I'm happy to do that. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, please feel free to grab Alex's contact information there. We can put that in the chat as well. Um, and I just want to share really quick um, for any other upcoming events for our Great Lakes Rota RC project. Um, we'd love to add you to our mailing list. If you uh, received this or logged in today without registering or was shared with you, um, the, that email is in the chat as well. So please feel free to email us and we can connect you to some other regional events happening. Um, and then 
I just want to note here too, and this and this might be um, relevant for folks. We have a couple. These are just a couple of our upcoming events. You can see on our events page here, um, and one of them to note here is how to be a recovery ally on April twentieth. Um, those are virtual events that you can um, sign up for on that events page. Again, that is in the chat as well. Um, and it looks like perhaps we have the wrong evaluation link, so we will make sure everyone gets the correct one um, that you can utilize to provide feedback for us regarding our event today. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to Alex, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. There was a question in the chat about will there be CEUs offered for this presentation. We will... Um, uh, the it, we will um, be able to provide a certificate with continuing education hours, contact hours, but not CEUs um, itself. So the contact hours. Sorry. Yes. Great. Thank you, Jen. All right. I see we've got some emails in there. We'll make sure we get those. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Kelly, you want to stop recording?